Okay, so two days ago, I was gifted a bag of magic mushrooms um, by my friend Roa. Uh, she gave me about 3.5 grams of the mushrooms and uh, advised that I take a full bag. Um, upon further discussions and doing some research on my own, uh, the conclusion was, okay, maybe not start with the full bag and maybe do half a bag um, from research that I did. And based on that research, I decided to take a quarter of the bag um, just because by nature, I tend to always err on the side of caution because it's better to slowly introduce something into your system if you're not familiar with how your body's going to react to it, then just kind of close your eyes and jump into something um, that may have negative or adverse reactions that you aren't adequately prepared for. And so that's exactly what I did. I took the bag, but I sectioned it into four pieces or four bags rather and started with a quarter of a dose. And I am not advocating, of course, I should probably start by saying I am not advocating um, that you try psychedelics. I just want to share my experience and the, the conclusions that I reached while on on the on the drugs I guess um if you are going to try I would advise you kind of take the same path that I did don't jump and you know go for the full quote epic or heroic doses I've seen videos of people on YouTube that kind of talk about their experience with quote epic doses of mushrooms or LSD or you know, psychedelics. And, you know, while that might work for them, I, in my opinion, I felt even just the quarter of a dose that I took, which was, like I said, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 grams, um, was a bit much. Um, and I'll, and I'll explain why. So first things first, I think that at least in my personal experience, it seems that what mushrooms do is they just kind of tend to magnify conclusions that you had already sort of formed on, at least on a base level and a latent level. That, that was my experience. Um, so while I was on the, on the drugs, on the mushrooms, I um, was kind of more reiterating things that I had already sort of observed and I already sort of knew about the nature of reality. Um, so when I say I'm not advocating the use of mushrooms, I actually mean that. I, I, I'm not saying don't use mushrooms. If you are interested or curious, you know, that's your path. I'm sure you will try it out. But I think that you can come to the same conclusions that a, a user, a person who uses psychedelics regularly, especially at um, very high doses, can come to just by a lot of introspective work, just by a lot of meditation, just by a lot of um, fasting, and by a lot of reading as well. So 99.9% .9 of the episodes and things that I discussed on this podcast, um, particularly within the last year or so, have been born out of introspection and deep thought, um, coupled with fasting and clean eating and meditation. And so even though you know the tagline to this podcast is this podcast will make you high, or I should say maybe, maybe make you feel high, um, I don't really utilize drugs and I stopped about a year ago using, about a year ago, using marijuana. Um, because I feel like all these, all these drugs are, are roads, they're paths that ultimately lead to a particular destination, but you can get to that same destination by other means. And that, and, and I strongly believe that. So while I'm not against the use of marijuana. I think a lot of people get a lot of benefit from it. I certainly did. Um, at first, it's just once I, quote, got the message, I hung up the phone, in the words of Alan Watts. And in the beginning, I took marijuana because I was very anxious. My mind would race. I would worry about everything. And um, it really helped me calm down. And it, quote, unquote, made me feel happy. But 
over time, I learned ways to manage my anxiety, manage my thoughts just by reading books, by reading books by Eckhart Tolle, um, The Power of Now, um, A New Earth, and really like reading them repeatedly and, and working on, on the things that he talked about, you know, and he discussed the pain body and stuff like that. So I trusted his teachings and I put his teachings into practice and was able to focus on now, become more present, which was more or less what the drugs were, what the marijuana was helping me achieve. But I was able to do it without the aid of drugs so that the drug no longer became like a clutch for me. I was able to kind of do that on my own. And so once I realized I could do that on my own, I was able to let it go. And so I think if you approach um, drug usage, and I'm talking about positive drugs, like, you know, natural plants and things of that nature, um, I think if you approach them respectfully, and with the mindset of I'm taking it, I don't want to take this for all my life, I want to take it in order to kind of tweak my brain to do something, you know, to, to behave in a certain way so that I can make myself aware that, okay, my brain can do this under certain circumstances, certain circumstances. Um, so if you can, if you take that to kind of establish something, and then once that's been established, you can slowly ease off of it so that you can stand in that place on your own. I think that that's a wise approach towards the utilization of particularly plant-based um, drugs. So that's my approach. And I came to that conclusion was strengthened um, under my usage of uh, of the quote magic mushrooms. Uh, and uh, so I want to I want to share that with you. Um, let's start by saying this two paths. The two paths are the use of psychedelics and the other path is meditation, fasting and introspection and reading. Both paths lead to enlightenment. Both paths lead to the understanding of the, the true nature of our reality being a false construct. And I don't think one is a better path than the other. I do. I personally enjoy the process of fasting, of meditating, of reading books, um, and I read books on quantum physics because then I have the scientific basis that can explain the construct, you know, the constructed nature of our reality. So I trust in the scientists and that allows me to start kind of breaking down the sort of thought forms that I built in my head as to the way I perceived reality. And then, you know, the writings of Buddhist teachers and Hindu teachers um, the writings of the Dhammapada, the writings of the Upanishads, and having these people who are steeped in the knowledge of Buddhism and Hinduism break it down in different ways. And trusting those teachers also helped deconstruct my perception of reality. Um, and then on my, on my own just personal experience, listening to my own intuition, paying attention to synchronistic events, communicating with my future self and allow my future self to guide me all coupled with you know meditation and focus right and and feeling what happens that change when you are deeply focused in the present and in the now um training my mind to do that without the use of drugs and of course um with fasting just the the chemical changes that are affected in your brain when you limit calories, uh, reduce your caloric intake, especially for, you know, long stretches of time, um, sort of mimic the effects that you see when you get, when you take in a psychedelic, psychedelic drugs, but all of these things are in your control. And there's still a part of you that's lucid as everything is going on. And so that's why I like about, that's what I like about my path. And that's also why I, appreciated the fact that I didn't start off with the mushrooms at the full dose. And I, I don't think I will ever, at least in, in this present time, I don't think that I, I don't believe that I will ever take like a full 3.5 dose, you know, um, gram dose. Um, there was a book I read. Um, hold on, let me pull up the title. The book is about an author who for 20 years took LSD at extremely high doses. And even he was saying um, that 
he did, he almost was like it was almost too much that if he had a chance to do it all again he would have started off with uh, smaller doses because the conclusions that he came to from 20 years of taking like 15 you know 16 grams of um LSD or psychedelics or whatever um it, it it was such a violent experience and it didn't have to be. And he felt that he could reach those same conclusions um, at smaller doses and kind of pacing himself. Um, the book is called LSD in the Mind of the Universe. And uh, it was written by Christopher M. Bosch, B-A-C-H-E, if you, want to, if you want to check it out. I will also say that from reading his book, um, and I read it after my quote trip, my mushroom trip, I realized that there's a lot of things that he wasn't even conscious of as he was talking. Um, and I just, I realized that from my experience, one is that your, your, what the mushrooms do is it just kind of magnifies what's already in your brain and whatever your predispositions are, it just magnifies that. And also too, it responds to the music and the energy that was put into the music by the composers and creator of the music. It just amplifies what's in the music. So a lot of the things that that author was discussing um, in his experience with mushrooms, to me, I was just like, like the violence that he was experiencing and things like that. He was listening to very primitive, quote, primitive music. um, And, you know, that was what he was picking up. He was picking up the, the associations of the deep cultural um, experiences that were embedded in the people who created the music and in that culture. And his mind was sort of interpreting it in a different way. Um, and he kind of took it to mean, you know, something other than, in my opinion, what was really going on. It was just him through music, traveling through time and through forms to sort of experience a different culture and all that came of it, all the energy that came of it. Um, and so bear that in mind that if you do decide to go down this path and you want to read or listen to books by people who have also gone down the path, that they're talking about their own path. They're talking about their own experience. And, and the way this drug works is it's what's happening in your brain, you know, that gets magnified, but it's also what's around them, who they're with, um, what they're going through in their life, what their past lives are. And so all of that kind of reflects, you know, as a reflection or becomes a reflection on their, uh, their drug experience. So just bear that in mind. Um, so if I had a chance to do it all again, would I even do it at a quarter dose? No. Um, I think for the eight hours, eight to 10 hours <laughs> that I was uh, under the influence, first of all, like that's a really long time to be high for me. I, I just, the majority of the time I felt good, but just me being a Virgo, I guess, I don't know, or just me being a control freak or whatever you want to call it. I don't even want to say control freak. I just like being lucid. I just like being lucid at all times. So calling myself a control freak, I don't want to control other people. I want to be able to be in a situation where something, you know, kind of groovy is happening, for lack of a better word, and I can come out of it and report back, you know, um, and write about it and talk to people about it. And Majority of the time, that's where I was, but I, I was, you know, my whole body was like, like a full blown orgasm, right? Like, like it did feel really good, and I felt really good for like six hours, you know, six seven hours. I, I felt really good, and I was laughing a lot. Um, but there was a part of me that was still kind of awake and aware. Like Joe was still there in the background, kind of experiencing everything, and like still talking shit. And, you know, some people listen to this may be like, well, that's because you didn't take a high enough dose and you want to, like, you want to destroy that version of yourself. You want to destroy the observer um, and become like everyone. But here's the thing. I already know that we are all one. Like I've been saying this throughout my, like every episode of my podcast, pretty much I say the same thing. You put any soul into a new body and you, you know, you will take on the habits and forms or whatever of that person's experience and become that person, which is why I say, you know, don't judge like people like Trump because he is what he is, you know, and just don't judge people, period. So I already have that understanding. Um, you know, putting myself through uh, all the negative stuff that comes with extreme high doses of, of um, 
of psycho psychedelics. Um, that's just not my not my vibe. I, why do I need to suffer to to come to the conclusions that I already come to? So I did want to be able to still be lucid and still be cognizant of what was going on, so I can clearly talk about it. And I'm always a joker. Like if you you show me something horrible, I'll probably find something fucked up to laugh about it, like something funny I, I should say to laugh at about the situation. I'm always looking for like the most grounding perspective on everything. So um, that's still me. And I and I would go as far as to argue. I said there was Joe in the background kind of watching everything, but it wasn't really Joe. It was like the operator, like the real me. Like Joe was just the form or whatever. So um, I would have dialed, dialed the dosage back even more, mostly because my intention with the drug isn't to feel six hours worth of orgasms. Like what, why, why, why do I want to like, that's not practical. Like that's just, okay, great. But I don't, you don't get anything from that, you know? And of course with, when you peak that high with pleasure, you're going to have to balance that out with like a negativity. And, and that's what happened. Like I didn't have a bad trip, but you know, I saw some really beautiful things with my eyes closed. And, you know, I saw the things that people paint about when they, you know, they trip and without even doing the full dosage. So I can imagine like a maximum dose that that would have probably projected itself, you know, into, into the construct or onto the construct when my eyes were uh, open. So I was only able to see these images when my eyes were closed. And a lot of the stuff, a lot of the information, a lot of the data that I gleaned, wasn't anybody talking to me. It was just more like a upload, like somebody uploaded the information into my brain and I could understand certain things or see certain things. Um, but I say all that to say this, I want, I would, I would rather approach mushrooms as like, you know, the movie Limitless, I'd rather approach mushrooms in that, in that sense, in the sense of using it as a drug maybe microdosing or, you know, just like mini dosing even where it allows your brain to connect right? You connect your left with your right brain. Because one thing that I did start doing was all of a sudden I started writing with my left hand and very quickly and very legibly. Um, And I was like, oh, let's see if I can do this. And I could do it. And then I just wrote whole pages of stuff with my left hand. Um, That's pretty cool. Um, But I ended up ultimately ended up switching to my right hand because it was, you know, faster. And I wanted to get my thoughts down even, you know, uh, more efficiently or whatever. But to be able to connect your brain, to be able to still be you, but just slightly better, I think that that's a better use of the drug. Sure, you you could, you know, kill the ego. But even in that book that I mentioned, the LSD book by uh, Christopher Bosch, even after 20 years of mega dosing, he says that the the death of self, the death of ego isn't the end of it. Becoming one with the universe isn't the end of it. Nirvana isn't the end of it. This this life goes on to infinity. And you can split and become everyone and you can become conscious of the fact that you're everyone, but you can you will also come back to being one soul entity again. So that shouldn't be the ultimate drive for a mushroom, you know, trip or a psychedelic trip, right? If you take that as a given, like I've been saying, you take that as a given that you are everyone, everyone is you, and they're all, we're all one, okay? Start with that. Then the next step should be, okay, now how do we all together work together to improve our, our lot in life, civilization, each other, and, and love each other, right? And to me, that's more, impor- more important, right? If people aren't going to go and meditate and fast, then yeah, take take psychedelics, but take it in a small dose. That's what I would say. Take it in, you know, let's say like 0.4 of a gram or 0.3 of a gram or 0.2 of a gram and, and microdose it every day. Take it where you use, like I said, like in the movie Limitless, where it makes you smarter. It makes you more empath- empathetic. It makes you more compassionate. It makes you more conscious, more aware Right. And it's probably it it will do that a lot faster than maybe, you know, meditating and mindfulness and reading all these books. Um, But to me, that's that's a better approach. And that's how we as a. Collective. Evolve past suffering and towards a a higher. um, Dimension. Right. And we keep moving on, moving up. That's that's what I would say would be a better approach to um, the use of psychedelics, particularly magic mushrooms. That's my conclusion. 
Um, you know, I've said, but I've played back and forth with, am I going to take it again? And, um, or I'm probably not going to, but the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know, if I am going to take it again, I, I will, I will take it at much smaller doses. Um, because, there was something there in the sense of like, I was talking a lot faster. I was, there was no pausing, right? I wasn't saying, um, or anything like that. You know, I was talking to my husband and I was able to get everything I wanted to say very quickly out and very directly. So, uh, that disconnect, because typically the reason why I say, um, and I stutter and things like that is because my brain goes so fast that my mouth almost can't pick, can't catch up. Um, and so what I've been forced to do is really slow down um, when I speak and pause before, um, I say the next thing, um, mostly so I can control the things that I'm saying and I don't, you know, react, but also so that I don't stumble over words. But when I was on the influence, I, um, or under the influence, I was able to just get everything I needed to say out without pausing or whatever. And, and no, and edit everything I was going to say. So I didn't say the wrong things. Bef- you know, beforehand. So my brain processing power matched my speaking ability. So the, the disconnect that I normally had when I was not, you know, on, when I'm not on mushrooms was gone. And it just, everything came out super fluid. And I like that. And if there was a way for me to kind of have that and, and be lucid, still be aware, like, then yeah, I, I, I would totally microdose um, mushrooms. And that's probably what I'm leaning towards. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Yeah, another thing. So I talked about, you know, being able to write with my left hand pretty legibly and, um, and, and being able to speak fluently without having to pause and just getting my thoughts out of my head. Um, that was great, too. Um, the laughing was great. Um, The six hour orgasm, like whole body orgasm was like, okay, it's cool. But you know, like after a while, it was like, all right. (laughs) And and yeah, you're you're probably listening to him like, who doesn't want to feel good for that long? Well, it's not sustainable. That's kind of where I feel. That's how I feel. Like you can't be happy all the time, right? There's always going to be, you got to counter that. And the next day, so I was, I was up the day before, but then the following day I was, I was down and it's almost like I had to pay for those six hours of pleasure for with like six hours of like quote suffering. I, I didn't really suffer, but I was a bit nauseous. It took me a while. I was slower. I was much slower. Right. So it took me a while to get out of bed. Um, I wasn't able to get things done for the first part of the day. I was like just sitting outside and just taking in the sun. And when I would be asked a question, like it took me a while before I could like speak. Um, so obviously I paid for that. I paid for that you know, positive and laughing and processing information super fast with having to counter that with, you know, okay, slowly being able, you know, just feeling nauseous, feeling like I had a hangover basically. And like I said, that was just the quarter dose. Um, so I'm grateful that I didn't take the half dose cause I probably still would be feeling, you know, off today. Um, everything gets balanced out. Um, and I'd rather just be sort of neutral in the sense of not not too happy, but not too you know down either. Just who I am, the way I am under normal circumstances, but maybe a little bit more motivation. Because that's one thing I did notice. Like, it's like I took it at like seven o'clock at night, and by like ten o'clock, ten thirty, I was like, I'm gonna go paint. And I painted like three little portraits. They look like shit, in my opinion. <laughs> like once they dry, I'm gonna go over them and kind of tweak them a little bit. But still. Like I was like going, going, going. And then I went and and went to like clean the kitchen a bit. So that was helpful. And that's what I think getting, um, getting into microdosing would be good. Um, so maybe that's the balance, um, to start by saying that, look, you can feel high quote unquote, just by meditating and fasting and, um, reading, you know, reading fictional books, I'm sorry, not fictional, reading nonfiction books by spiritual teachers and scientists about quantum physics and the nature of reality, you know, it it gives you the same feeling. I can attest that because even when I took the mushrooms, I was like already just, I'd been fasting that whole day. Like I hadn't eaten that whole day until about seven o'clock. So before I even took the mushrooms, I already felt high. 
right? So, and that's how I am usually most days when I fast. So it was, the only difference was like I was processing stuff really fast and I was speaking really quickly and I was writing with my left hand and then the whole body orgasms. That's literally the only difference. Um, When I closed my eyes and I had the visions, I had one vision that said, they tried to tell me that I was like an alien princess. Um, And I just laughed at that because I thought it was stupid. Like I'm not a princess. Like my energy doesn't even feel like feminine in any way, shape or form. Um, and, but it was predicated on the music I was listening to. Cause once I turned the music, then another vision came through. And the second vision I had with like a different, um, with a different song, as soon as that song started playing, then I started seeing like, like giant spiders kind of rolling, like rushing towards me. And, um, it was supposed to be scary, but once again, there was a part of me that was still very lucid. And I just laughed at that too. Um, that that could have had the potential of being like a quote bad trip to like a normal person. Um, it's just things like that don't really affect me anymore because of the things, the work that I've been doing up until this point with meditating, fasting, being introspective, becoming really cognizant of nature, reality, and understanding that everything is an illusion. Everything's, you know, it's all a construct. So when I'm seeing these images and they're running towards me and all of these quote negativity wanted to kind of come up, I just was like, yeah, okay, this is just another like level of the game. It's like watching a scary movie. It doesn't really move me. And so I changed the music. And then I had this other um, vision with my eyes closed of like feeling like I was this great dragon entity. Like I felt like I was this great dragon um, overlooking the whole world. And that kind of felt more like me, but I still realized that that was just another um, aspect of the illusion. And so I kind of wiped that um, and moved on. And then I found this one song that I really liked Um, and then I just played that on repeat for like literally three or four hours. Um, and that was what motivated me more to paint. Um, trying to find the song. It was by my favorite composer, Abel Korzeniowski. And so normally when, when people trip, right, they say you should prepare like an eight hour, you know, music list. And to me, I was like, why do I need to prepare like something over eight hours when I could just find one song that I really like and listen to it uh, over and over and over and over again, which is what I did. Um, I'm still trying to find the, the song in case you are interested you wanted to listen to it but once I played that then that was what kind of shifted me to okay get up and go um ah the song is called dance for me Wallace dance for me Wallace so once I played that song then once again everything shifted and I was like everything was light and happy and I felt like let me go and paint and then I was like dancing with my husband and I was laughing and everything felt super pleasurable and then I just was like okay well this is good (laughs) let me just replay this um, and as long as that song played, I felt elated, which is why I think that you are tuning in when you play different musics, different songs, um, while you're under the influence, you are tuning in to the art. And it made me think of, uh, like in the future, like in the future, when psychedelics become, um, legal, I think what's that's gonna what's gonna happen? Like you're gonna go to like a concert or something. You're gonna take, you know, like LSD or some sort of you know like a small dose, a micro dose of LSD, and you're gonna walk in like a movie theater, and they're going to like connect you to these machines, and then you're gonna wait. It's gonna about fifty minutes or an hour for the LSD to kick in or the you know psychedelics to kick in, and then there's gonna be a projector. And kind of like a Futurama episode where what you start seeing, they'll play the music, they'll play whatever music, and then you start seeing what was basically the the picture behind the song. Your mind will interpret that and then you'll visualize it. And that visualization will get projected into like a VR helmet or whatever. And then that will be like the experience. Like, yeah, that's, that's inspiration. You guys should work on that. <laughs> uh, work on a VR machine that allows you to project what your mind sees when it listens to classical music or any kind of music um, into a sort of semi-tangible virtual reality form that you can view on a VR helmet. 
that's dope. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of more my experience. Um, dance with me. Wallace is a song and, um, what else, what else, what else, what else? Oh, one more thing. So I did reach some revelations that I probably would have come to anyway, just through fasting and meditation and reading. Um, but I want to share that with you. Um, a big recurrent theme that I kept talking, saying to my friends when I was typing is that, um, we all feed on energy. Um, and like, you've got to look at life beyond, you, you really, 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 really have to work on looking at who you are as not as a body, not as the person you see in the mirror, but as the entity that's controlling the body. So if you're 30 years old, you need to stop thinking that you're 30 years old and you need to start understanding that you're more than likely, if we're going on the amount of life experiences that you've had and how many lives you've lived, you're probably closer to like 300,000 years old or 30,000 years old. This is not your first go. This is not your first run. This is not your first incarnation. Okay. So with that mindset, understand that just like your body needs to feed on energy, right? So we call that calories, right? Your body feeds on energy. That's what, that's what calories are. Um, so just like your body needs to feed on energy, your soul, your spirit, your consciousness also feeds on energy. And so I'm going to start drawing comparisons. I'm going to start drawing parallels on one end, right? An apple and like a handful of fries probably have the same amount of calories, right? But one is a positive source of energy. It's a healthy source of energy, which is like the, the apple, obviously, right? And then one is what you, one could argue a negative source of energy, right? Which is carbs and salt and fat and, you know, heat. But they're both energy. They both translate to calories, right? Which is the, the measurement of energy. Um, however, it gets absorbed into your body differently. Um, the same thing happens with your soul. Your soul, this, this whole world is a type of, um, it's a, is a type of drug. This whole world is a drug. Life is a drug. Okay. You need to run on it. They say life is a trip. What they mean by that is it's a fucking drug. Everything is a drug. Everything is a drug. Everything that you experience in, in this life is a drug, right? It's something that your brain kind of feeds off of to give you a particular ex- experience, Everything is a drug. And more importantly, what, what I want to focus on is not the drug aspect of it, but the energetic aspect of it. So let's go back to the analogy of the apple and the fries. Okay. Now, as above, so below, right? On the macro, so the micro, right? So you can understand a lot about the nature of your soul by looking at the way your body operates. Okay. So a person who consumes a lot of fruit, they tend to be healthier, right? Fruits and vegetables, because even though they're consuming calories, they're, they're taking a more positive form of energy, right? Nature's food, nature's energy is positive. And then a person who just eats fries and burgers all day, you know, it's the same energy, it's the same calories, but that energy is going to express itself negatively, you know, and you'll see that on the person's like body as they, you know, gain weight or the way they gain weight or, you know, their skin how their skin looks and, you know, their the overall health. If you eat, if you spend a whole year, I think that guy super sized me did that. He spends a whole, spent a whole year eating fast food versus spending a whole year eating fruits and vegetables, um, you know, and like steamed fish. I'm not saying be vegan. I'm just saying like cleaner, quote cleaner. Um, and you consume the same amount of calories throughout that year. The person, you know, person A who spent the whole day, a whole year eating consuming positive foods and and consuming positive sources of caloric energy is going to look markedly different than a person who spent, you know, the same year eating the same amount of calories, but from negative sources like fried food and chips and, um, you know, steaks and, you know, deep fried everything and ice cream, right? You can agree on that. So the same thing happens internally with your soul. Okay, with your consciousness, there are people out there who feed on pain. Um, there are people out, out there who feed on suffering. There are people out there who feed on negativity. Negativity, and whether they're cognizant of or not, cognizant of it or not, that's a whole different conversation. But just like you can feed off of fries versus um, fruits, you can also feed off of positivity versus negativity. It's all energy, and it's all consumable. I'll say it three times. It's all energy and it's all consumable. 
everything is energy and it's all consumable. When you go on social media and it's just negativity after negativity after negativity, and you're like, I don't feel good. I don't like the way this makes me feel. Okay, that's fine. But the reason why you don't stop looking at it is because on some level you are feeding off of that and you are deriving a certain level of pleasure from it because it's a type of drug, right? And the effect that it has on you, on your psyche, the effects the negativity and the negative energy has on your psyche, I just dropped my phone, on your psyche, um, it does have adverse effects. It, you know, it leads to you, you basically having an unhealthy soul. Um, it's just not as apparent as maybe, you know, being physically seeing somebody who eats a lot of fast food, you start to see it on their skin. Um, you start to see it on the person's soul. They be, they too become sort of negative, depressed, um, emotionally withdrawn, all these sort of things, but that's because they're feeding off of negativity. You almost have to think of your soul as a kind of parasite. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, but you almost have to think of your soul as a kind of parasite. Um, and it's a parasitic entity that's attached to the body. That's the best way to, to, um, to explain it. And if that quote parasite, um, is feeding on negativity, it's almost like, uh, the movie it where the clown, uh, it feeds on the fears of the children and that's what makes it stronger. And somebody had drawn a comparison to, um, Mary Poppins. And they said that these two entities, Mary Poppins and it are actually the same species and they are one just feeds off negativity and the other one feeds off positivity but they both need energy from the children to survive so it's the same thing your soul needs energy to survive and just in the same way as your body needs energy to survive so your body can feed off of positive foods or negative foods it's still energy and your soul can feed off of positive um, things and negative things it's still energy so people who bring out like bring a lot of suffering into their lives and they're and this was hard for me and bear in mind that all these conclusions and now everything i'm telling you um came to me while i was under the influence of the of the mushroom so that's i'm sharing it with you this was hard for me to accept but i knew on some level that it was true um but you see people who are suffering and you go like why why is there why is there suffering um and what i was told was or what I, what I gleaned was it's the same thing as like asking like why is there bitter food or why is there spicy food some people really enjoy unfortunately some people really enjoy neg negative energy some people really their souls not them right cuz bear in mind that they're still their soul isn't conscious of what's going on because their sh their soul has been made to forget while they're in this reality right but their soul is not 30 years old their soul has like countless incarnations and throughout all these incarnations they their souls might have developed a penchant for negativity right just like a person through throughout their life right develops a taste for beer if you taste beer the first time it's disgusting if you taste whiskey the first time it's like oh why would you drink that but if you talk to people who drink beer for a long time they say well it's an acquired taste it, it doesn't taste good but they've acquired a taste for it and just like these people who suffer um and unfortunately their life is suffering it doesn't feel good, but they've acquired a taste for it. And so they they continue to consume it because on a some, on some level, they're addicted to it the way they're addicted to the pain. They're addicted to the energy, the negative energy, because like the same way you're addicted to food, right? Some people have said that you don't really need to eat as much food as, as we eat. And some people have also said that, which I agree. And some people have also said that there are people out there who can who just feed off of the energy of the sun. I've never tried that. Um, but there are stories out there, just Google it. Um, but on, on some level, you could argue that we are all addicted to food and the energy that we get from food, right? Um, so throughout all these people's incarnations and their past lives, they have, they have developed an acquired taste for suffering. And so they will put themselves in situations where they suffer, where it is... Whereas like say they meet somebody and right away they can tell like this person is like an abusive person or there's just certain cues that the, the individual kind of gives off that if you were in tune with your consciousness and you were conscious of the fact that, okay, I'm attracted to negativity, like a person is attracted or craves um, bitter foods or coffee or whatever, 
Um, and if they want to make a difference and want to change and they can take a step back and say, I don't want this anymore. But because they don't, they're not, a lot of people just aren't conscious. Their soul just wants the energy and it's been predisposed to seeking out negative energy and feeding off of it. So it's going to be attracted. This is deep guys. You probably have to re- listen to like you know, the second half of this, um, a few times so it kind of sinks in it had to sink in for me but they're going to kind of seek out like abusive relationships or even like you know watch bad things like they watch terrible things like they keep watching the news for example even though it's like it's it makes them feel bad um but just because it makes them feel bad doesn't mean they're not getting something out of it they're not feeding off of it right um so whatever past incarnations that they had had kind of leads them to have a predisposition towards seeking that out. doesn't mean that it can't change. doesn't mean that they can't become conscious of it and decide, I don't want to do this anymore. But a person will meet a person and they go like, this person isn't good for me. But then they'll like still enter the relationship and then suffer. Um, but that's kind of why I, why I sort of rage against the entities that wipe our memories Um, at our near-death experiences and our death experiences when they do the life review. It's like, if you wipe our memories, how the fuck are we supposed to stop from kind of doing these same things over and over again? That's not cool, you know? Um, But a lot of people don't realize that what they're doing, they're unconscious for the the most part, but they find themselves in negative situations where they're suffering, but there's a part of themselves that kind of feeds off of the negativity. Um, I'm going to take it back to drugs. So there are positive drugs and there are negative drugs. Just like everything else in this world, there's positivity and there's negativity. Everything is dual in this world. It's a dual reality, right? So you have, for example, what I would call positive drugs, which are like mushrooms and um, marijuana. Not like the crazy strains of marijuana that like man has like bastardized now with crazy amounts of THC and no CBD. I'm talking about like marijuana is in its natural form before people started fucking with it. And mushrooms um, in low doses. Those are positive drugs, and if you take them in, in you know the right amount of dosage, it's going to give you a positive effect. It's going to affect the way you behave now, and and it's going to affect your outlook. So you're feeding off of the energy. Your brain is feeding off the energy that that you know those drugs like produce, and it puts you in a positive state. Now there's negative drugs. So you have negative drugs are like um, meth, um, like heroin, right? Like the crazy stuff, like opioids, where the more people use it, th- those are negative drugs, right? Uh, the more people use it, the lower the vibration, the, the vibrations become, and the more um, like you can kind of see the negative effects on the on their physical form, particularly meth, right? Like their hair starts falling off, their skin's all like you know bad. They start shaking, they have the tremors, their teeth kind of start messing up. Like that's the opposite. So everything in this world is dual. Everything is in this world is dual. So you can see the physical effects on a, uh, on an individual when they consume negative energy right? In the form of negative drugs, negative foods, um, things like that. But you can also see it on their physical form when they consume negative energy, like um, consuming too much news, um, watching like bad things on TV, reading negative things, um, constantly criticism or constant criticism, criticizing other people. Um, They're just unhappy people, right? But they're cons- those are people who are consuming negative energy. So I, I want to draw the parasitic um, entity kind of uh, visual to your mind form. That you've, I'm sure you've seen these movies where these, there's always these entities that, because they feed on negativity, they start to become sort of negative themselves, right? Um, and then they have the opposite end of people who, for better or worse, like they, they feed on positivity. Like you'll see them, they're always like dancing. They listen to upbeat music. They watch, they only watch happy things. They stay away from, you know, things that bring them down. Um, they, you know, they also tend to eat kind of clean too. They tend to be those kind of hippie kind of people, you know, like they tend to be vegan. They just, they're really addicted. Um, we're all addicted. So this is not a judgment call, but they just tend to be addicted and pull their energy from, um, positive sources. Um, and I'm saying, like, I'm trying to make you conscious of this, of this right now, that you have a choice, right? You have a choice to as to what you consume. Either way, you're going to get energy, right? So whether, whether or not you're eating a, an apple or fries, you're going to get the energy if they're both equal in calories. Um, but now that you're aware of it, you can make yourself more conscious of the choices that you make and avoid, you know, taking in or feeding on negativity because it does negatively affect you. You can't 
you know, what you eat becomes you, right? You are what you eat. Thank you. That's the, <laughs> that's a euphemism. So you are what you eat. You are what you consume. If you consume negative energy, you become a negative entity and you might end up reincarnating into an increasingly negative um, life cycle over and over and over again until you decide, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. The same way a drug addict, a person who's on, you know, math or, you know, crack or whatever, or any drug really decides, you know, I don't want the negative aspects of this. I got to do better. I don't want to eat fries anymore. I want to eat, I got to do better and you can shift. So the choice is there. The choice is yours, but I'm trying to make you aware of it. Um, so those are, those are the, uh, ideologies that kind of came to me, um, that I was kind of prompted to share with you guys, um, on this podcast, um, being aware of what's really going on, what you're feeding on. And then I talked to my friend Roa today and she was talking about, um, you know, police and, you know, is it their job that kind of makes them more negative because of the people that they, you know, have to work with, you know, constantly working with criminals. And I said, it's, it's dual. Um, if you have a predisposition, like, think about like, why would you be choose to become a cop? We all, we all know the negative, um, connotations that are, that are kind of, like are attached to police, you know, um, and what their job entails. I would argue, I'm not saying that cops are bad people. They're good people who become cops, but there are good people who find themselves addicted to bad drugs, to negative drugs, right? So you almost have to ask yourself, like, what is it about who they were before they became police officers and, and, and that kind of made them become police officers? Like, what were they... What are the inclinations, right? What were they predisposed to? Is this a soul, right? Because remember, we're not looking at the individual anymore. We're looking at the soul controlling consciousness. You're not 30 years old. You're like 30,000 years old. You need to really let that sink in. Stop identifying with the form you see in the mirror and understand that it's bigger than one incarnation. This shit's been going on since infinity. This is not your first go. Energy can be created or destroyed, only modified. And you've been modified countless times. That needs to really sink in. That really needs to sink in before you start to understand what's really going on in this plane, in this planet, in this reality, in this dimension, and throughout. And it's going to keep going on for infinity. You just have to decide if you want to be stuck on this plane or you want to keep going to the next plane, the next plane, the next plane. It goes on forever. And maybe that's part of why the memories get wiped. I don't know. Um... But you have to ask yourself, these individuals, you know, what, what were their past incarnations like that kind of predisposed them to, to basically seeking out situations where they would be sort of around negativity, right? And then once you kind of get in that situation and you can, you're, all you're going to see is negativity, right? Because you already have a predisposition to negativity and then you start projecting that negativity out on other people or you become attracted to other quote negative people um who you are interacting with or dealing with either your co-workers or the you know the people that you're attempting to police which just creates an even more um negative uh sort of feedback loop um it's kind of like people who do the same kind of drugs tend to kind of hang out with each other um like really think about it like bars, right? It's filled with people who really enjoy drinking alcohol. Um, people who smoke weed, like they tend to surround themselves with other people who mostly only smoke weed. So if you are feeding off of negative energy, you're going to surround yourself and be surrounded by people who also feed on or are addicted to, and both, um, the negative energy. And then that just creates an even more negative, um, self-fulfilling sort of uh, prophecy. Um, but everything is, en everything is energy and everything is food. Um, everything is, everything is there for consumption more or less. Um, so if you start looking at things in that nature and understand, okay, so if I'm, if I'm, I'm doing this, why am I doing this? Let me pause and ask myself, like, why do I keep arguing with this person? Right? Why do I keep, you know, why do I keep criticizing people? Another thing Rose said to me was that, you know, she's at the job, she hates her job um, because people there just keep um, criticizing her. And I said, well, um, you know, they're not happy either. And you can't be happy and criticize other people. So they were probably attracted to a negative environment. You can feel this. Like if I stare at you, if you're sitting at a bar 
and I'm staring at you with malice, your skin's going to crawl. You can feel negative energy. So if you, you can also feel positive energy. Um, I asked my husband about this. He's a public kind of speaker. And I said, how does it feel to have all those people staring at you in one time? And he said, um, you could feel it. If it's something that it, where they aren't happy with what I'm saying, you feel it. You feel the negativity in their energy. And when it's something that what I'm saying is positive, you can feel that too. So you can feel the energy. So my argument is that work environment already has contained within it uh, is a, some, a toxic uh, work environment. And toxic just means negative. It's a negative work environment. When you go into the interview, on some level, you can feel you can feel it on the subconscious level, whether this is going to be a, a positive work environment or a negative work environment. Um, but because you're unconscious of the fact that there's a part of you that might be predisposed towards a consumption or addicted to negativity, addicted to consuming negative energy, kind of like a, um, a meth addict, right, is addicted to this negative drug. If you're, I'm not, you, you don't have to be a bad person to be addicted to negativity, I'll say that again. You, aren't, you don't have to be a bad person to be addicted to negativity. Oftentimes, opposite attracts. Now, oftentimes, there's people with good hearts, right? Like, uh, you know, protons and electrons kind of attract each other. So oftentimes, particularly if you find that you are a good person with a good heart and you keep finding yourself in, yourself in negative situations, that's because you're, not on, you're, you're, you're kind of unconscious and you're not aware of the fact that you're being automatically automatically, automatically attracted to this negative, um, situations, um, because opposites attract. If you're unconscious, if you're unconscious, opposites will attract. If you are unconscious and you have a good heart, a positive heart, you will be attracted to, uh, negative circumstances and negative situations. That's the purpose of this podcast is to bring it to your attention, um, as best as I can, um, so that you can become conscious and then stop kind of pulling yourself or allowing yourself to be pulled into these sort of um, circumstances and the environment. So um, say you go to an interview and on some level, your subconscious, your intuition picks up on the fact that this is a negative work environment. Because you have an addiction, addiction to negative energy, maybe based on your present incarnation, might be based on your experiences of past incarnation, which have kind of led you to acquire a taste for negativity, um, you will choose to work in that environment because there's a part of you that's addicted to that. On, on the opposite end, there are people who will go into that same interview in that same work environment and don't like negative energy and have consciously chosen or even unconsciously chosen to only feed on positive energy, kind of like a person who just likes sweets. There are people out there who just like sweets and they're, they're not conscious of it. They just like sweets because it tastes good and they like fruits because they taste good as opposed to people who like bitter foods like coffee and you know things like that it's all about your taste um so you can also unconsciously um sort of uh avoid negative circumstances and, and negative situations and just only seek out positive energy there are people like that out there as well um but if you don't make yourself aware that this is happening this is all energy and that your soul is hungry right your soul is hungry, just like your body can get hungry, and it will seek out both either positive or negative, depending on your life experience and your in, your previous incarnations and experiences of your previous incarnations. If you don't make yourself conscious of this, you will find yourself in situations where you are going to be consuming and subsequently consumed by either energy. The key, obviously, is to become conscious of it, and especially if you want to change, and make sure that once you start observing hey, this could potentially be, quote, negative. If you don't want to consume negativity, then put it down, walk away, leave it, right? And um, once you become sort of aware of that, become conscious, then you, you will no longer be attracted to something that you don't no longer want to consume. The same way as like people who are alcoholics, right? They, you know, avoid, like they, they don't put alcohol in their homes, right? Especially at the beginning when they're trying to avoid um, temptation. They remove themselves from, they remove temptations for themselves, um, from themselves so that they can kind of go back to, to, to who they were before the consumption kind of set in, um, and they can heal. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. All our bodies are doing is acting out what's happening in our, on the inside, in our souls, in our consciousness. And, and that's all this world is. We're just acting out past 
you know, experiences and acquired tastes um, unconsciously. And a few of us do become conscious. And I'm, I would argue that more and more, more and more of us could be and are becoming more conscious. And that's kind of what the nature of these sort of talks are, um, to kind of make you conscious so that you can choose different, right, and live differently. Um, so, yeah, so those are my observations um, on mushrooms. And that's my mushroom trip. I uh, just want to share that with you guys. Um, yeah, really think about the things that I've been saying, uh, particularly in this episode, um, particularly the last like you know, 30 minutes that I've been talking. Because um, that's part of how we change this world. Um, everything that happens, another thing I realize is that the world is the, is the way it is. It's kind of neutral. And um, for me personally, I, I work on staying neutral. So I don't consume negative energy. I try not to. Um, and I try not to consume too much positive energy either. Like I try to stay balanced. Um, that's kind of like why I said when I was under the influence and I was like having this crazy pleasurable experience with the mushrooms, I just kind of was like, ah, okay, I know I'm going to have to pay for this, <laughs> you know? And sure enough, like there came the dump, the energy dump of the next day and feeling nauseous and everything like that. I don't want extremes. And I read that, um, I learned about this from reading, uh, the Kabbalion and it's about staying neutral, staying above, right? Avoiding highs and lows and just staying, you know, base level. It's also why I also fast. It's kind of like abstinence, abstaining from consumption of any type of energy and just kind of being at peace. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very mindful of what I partake in, right? So if I'm talking to somebody, for example, and they're criticizing, it's very tempting to jump in and start criticizing as a person, particularly as a person who used to be addicted to that kind of negativity and that kind of negative um, energy. Um, but instead I, I stay quiet and I don't, I don't, I don't engage. Um, but on the opposite end, you know, if it's something where people are like, oh, do this, it's going to make you feel really, really good. I also don't engage because I, I understand that um, I'm going to have to pay for that really, really good experience um, with, a, <laughs> with there's going to be a cost to that. So I try to stay neutral. I start, I try to just find small joys in like the da- daily life. Like, for example, I'll leave you with this. So little things that make me happy. I found a blanket at Walmart. It was like a down alternative blanket um, at Walmart. Uh, walmart.com for like $25 and it was like a king king size one and like I got joy from that joy I felt good about that because um my husband and I like we have like a two twin beds that come together um it's like one of those adjustable beds or whatever so he has his side and I have my side and I have like a white blanket and he has a green blanket and I just wanted it to be I wanted our blankets to match but I didn't want to spend a lot of money doing it um, and so I found this blanket for like 25 bucks that will allow it so that our beds, our comforters match. And I didn't have to spend a lot of money. Like you, you're hearing that and you're just like, what? <laughs> but for me, like even telling you the story, like I get a lot of joy from that. And that joy to me is what's more neutral. It's, it's, it's my, it's not extreme. You know, it's not, I don't feel ecstatic, but I don't feel depressed either. Like it's, I'm, I'm at this happy sort of base level medium. And so little things make me happy, like go or not. I just contradict myself. Little things give me peace. So being able to sit for hours, like three, four hours, five hours, just painting. I find there's peace. from. I get peace from that. I get joy from that. All right. It doesn't necessarily like, it's not extreme where I'm like, oh my God, yes. Like I'm, you know, manic in, in painting. No, it's just this calm sort of like, I'm in a happy sort of neutral place. Um, and like fruits make me happy. Like I don't, things that are crazy extreme, like I don't eat like super, super sweet food. Um, I just, you know, everything's just kind of bland and sort of, not bland, that's the wrong choice of word, but I am going to use the word bland. Um, everything is just sort of, you know, neutral, you know, not too sweet, not too bitter. Like I like, you know, like fruits that are just like, I like dragon fruit, you know, it's just neutral. It's not too sweet. It's not too bitter. It's just nice. Um, and that's why the word bland popped into my mind. Some people unconsciously or maybe even consciously do choose suffering because they feel like a life without suffering could be quote bland. Um, 
and that's their choice. And, 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 and I will say this, I will leave you with this. Ultimately, whether or not you choose to suffer or not suffer, whether or not you choose to imbibe negativity or positivity, um, it doesn't matter. This world is predicated upon our choices and what the world is and what we're seeing is a reflection of the choices that we are making either consciously or, or, or unconsciously. It's up to us. And so all I'm doing is like, I want to bring this to you, the forefront of your attention so that going forward, if you don't want to suffer, you don't have to. You can make yourself aware of it and subsequently make better choices. All right. Stay golden, guys.